So, you know, I got into EB um, a number of years ago, um, and I'll give you a little bit about the story, because some of you may have heard it before, but some of you have not. Um, but, you know, I take, I'm a leukemia doctor, and I take care of children predominantly with different types of cancers. Um, and, in fact, most of my work is done taking care of people with incurable diseases. Um, and so what the hope is is that you find a cure. And I guess there's a saying that, you know, uh, difficult things can be done right away, but the impossible just takes a little longer. So we just refuse to believe that this can't be one of those incurable diseases that can never be cured. So as Brett was saying, you know, hopefully there are a number of mottos from this meeting this week. And hopefully this is just the beginning of trying to find that cure in the not too distant future. But what I would like to do if, if the first slide comes up, oh, I guess it's already locked. When you have patient information on your computer, everything has to be locked up. So what I'd like to do is to give you at least you know, what my belief of the understanding is of using bone marrow as a source of stem cells to correct this horrible disease. As some of you know, this all began with Teresa Lau, who a number of years ago came to me at a meeting in New York and basically held up her first son, Jake, as shown in the right-hand side, and said, save him. Well, you know, I didn't know what EB was at that particular time. Yes, I'd heard about it in medical school, but you know, like many of the doctors you first meet, many of those don't know too much about EB unless you happen to come across, you know, and very lucky enough to be at an EB center. But nonetheless, you know, this was a woman who was not willing to just give in and say, okay, well, you know, you don't know about it, so I'll move on. She actually said to me that, you know, I'm on this train to find this cure and you can either jump on with me or get out of the way. As some of you know, Teresa doesn't mince words. What she says is what she believes. And like all of you in this room, you know, you're taking on this cause because you're there to find a cure. And so what we did is then we went back to the um, lab and tried to figure out what we were going to do about this disease. Now, I should point out to you that uh, you'll see throughout here, it says patient 1.1 or 1.2 or whatever that there have now been three different trials of EB, and the first number refers to which trial, and the second number refers to which patient in that trial. And you can see that patients one and two happen to be Nate and Jack, Jake. Now, Jake was the one she held in front of me, but he didn't have a, a donor in the family, but Nate did, and that's the reason why Nate went first, because it was HLA matched sibling donor, and then Jake went subsequently to transplant. Now, we are only interested right now in the early phases of doing this work with EB is taking the sickest patients uh, that have this disease, the most severe forms of this disease, until we verify that we have a very safe approach, and then we'll move into hopefully patients with better risk disease, uh, but we're still in that early phase of learning how to do this as best as we can. So our focus has been on the severest forms of recessive dystrophic uh, dis uh, EB, as well as the more severe forms of junctional EB. This is a patient who I met in, um, in Toronto who is about 20 years old, who's lived with EB for obviously his entire life, but with very severe disease, where he's actually gone through many different types of skin grafting and basically is in the hospital most of his life. And you can just imagine the pain that he goes through. And this is the type of patient that we're hoping to figure out a way of at least ameliorating the, the severity and improve his quality of life. As many of you in this audience, if not all of you, know that what we're trying to do is we're trying to, to replace a missing protein. And who you'll meet tomorrow, Jacob Tolar in our group, will refer to it as a Velcro, a way of having that outer layer of skin stick to the rest of the body. And can we replace enough of that missing protein of collagen 7 or the laminin-5, which is for the junctional form, or at least one of the junctional forms, can we replace enough of that in the appropriate numbers and the appropriate amounts that will result in at least improvement of the integrity of the skin? And so what I can tell you from the very beginning is that it works dramatically well for some patients, works modestly well for others, and not so well in some. And what we're trying to figure out is why is that the case, and I'll give you some ideas of why I think that might be the case as I go through the presentation. So why did we even begin this, this, this work? Well, as I said, what we did is that we had this woman who refused to accept no for an answer, and she said, you know, I want you to figure out how to use bone marrow stem cells or core blood stem cells as a way of trying to repair this disease. 
Well, you just can't do it for the sake of doing it, although technically we could. We had to have at least some proof of concept that this could work, and that work was done first in the animal models. But the underlying hypothesis in all this, at least the way a scientist would think about it, is that why would this work? Do we expect that a bone marrow stem cell is going to sort of take up shop in the skin and repair the skin? Is there a skin stem cell that happens to be sitting in the bone marrow? Or is it much more straightforward than that, that actually what we know from other types of diseases, we can actually replace a missing protein by just the circulating white cells that go through your skin. So think of it as a passing through white cell that happens to secrete the collagen 7 or the, the laminin that's missing. And then just in, in the right amounts that it will allow it then to repair, at least partially, the severe skin disease that's affecting that particular patient. Well, if that didn't work, we had one other fallback. And the one thing I need to explain to you is that when you do a bone marrow transplant, you're not only replacing the bone marrow white cells, that is, the, the bone marrow produces the white cells that fight infection, the red cells that carry oxygen, the platelets that stop bleeding, but it also replaces your immune system. So what I mean by that is that if I replace your immune system, that means that donor is the perfect match for everything else. And so, for example, if one of you in this audience could be the, serve as the donor for another family member that happens to have EB, you could also serve as a donor for skin grafting. And so the idea was, even if the missing protein was not suitable enough, we might actually be able to do skin grafting without fear or chance of rejection of that new skin, something they ordinarily couldn't just do without replacing the, 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 the immune system in the patient with that of the donor. So at least that was why we got started. Now when we do a bone marrow transplant, what we do is we actually remove bone marrow from the hips of the, of the donor. Um, you can do other things other ways, but that's the standard practice of how you get those stem cells out. So think of a ham bone. You see the middle part, that's the marrow, and that's what we're removing, and actually then subsequently injecting those cells back through an IV catheter. Fortunately, the stem cells know where to go. We don't have to inject it back into the bone, as you might have guessed, at least in some people, that's what they would have presumed. So in order to get that to work, because this is not yourself, your body would reject those stem cells immediately. So we have to give you some type of preparative therapy, a conditioning regimen that will allow your body to accept those new cells. The one thing that I should also point out to you is that bone marrow transplant is the most expensive procedure that is done, more expensive than heart transplants, liver transplants. And the reason why it's so expensive is because of the fact that we're trying to trick that immune system to uh, the donor to accepting you as the recipient as itself. Well, I'll explain that a bit more in a, few, in a few minutes, but suffice it to say, in patients with leukemia, we give either high doses of chemotherapy or we give a radiation as a strategy for allowing those new stem cells to take. And we also have to give post-transplant immune suppression so that those new stem cells don't reject the patient. Okay, so after one more piece of information. When you do a kidney transplant, you have to worry about the patient rejecting the kidney, and you have to worry about that as well with a bone marrow transplant, and that's the reason why we give this chemotherapy in advance. But after transplant, we never worry about the kidney rejecting the patient, but in the setting of bone marrow transplant, remember, that's where the immune system comes from. That donor's immune system will see that patient as being foreign and try to reject it. So you have rejection going in both ways. So this, will, this explanation will hopefully help you understand why we chose the path that we did in trying to get this therapy to work, because if we can't get the stem cells in, it's not going to work. Okay. So as I said to you beforehand, is that this all first began with mouse experiments that were performed by Jacob Tolar, who's in the back of the room, who will be speaking tomorrow. And what these experiments were was to be able to figure out if we could find the right stem cell population that would actually work in a, in a mouse that had EB. So it was a genetically uh, made mouse that was missing the collagen 7. And I can tell you that what I hypothesized to be the stem cell that was actually going to correct the disease, and that's what this is telling you, is that I thought it would be a skin stem cell or it would be something we called the multipotent adult stem cell that you got from marrow that had the capacity to make every other type of stem cell, or at least we thought so at the time. As it turned out, my guesses were wrong. It turned out to be a different type of stem cell, which was a surprise to me and I think some of the other people as well. 
But if nothing else, we were to be co-transplanting bone marrow so that we would create that tolerance. So the immune system wouldn't see those new stem cells as being foreign, and that was also critically important for the success of this overall experiment. So to make a long story short, Dr. Tolar injected various forms of stem cell populations, and the initial results were all very disappointing. Everything was zero, zero, zero. These animals only survive for about 14 days if, they don't, if they're not rescued by the stem cell therapy. But fortunately, in one last experiment, he was able to show that three animals survived. This was critically important to the future of this field because if those three animals had not been survivors, or at least of what we know at the time, we might not be doing bone marrow transplants today. But this particular subpopulation of bone marrow stem cells is a unique population, and although we can't enrich for it in the, in the human, we were able to enrich for it in the mice, and it's probably because it's a very rapidly repopulating stem cell that is what allowed those mice to survive. Well, I'm sure this is all sort of somewhat fascinating to you, but perhaps not all that interesting, other than to say, this is what allowed us to move to transplant. It's these types of experiments that you're trying to find funding for that will hopefully move us to the next generation of the next new therapy, and this is how it's basically done. So what did the mice look like? Well, the bottom line is, is that they had evidence of prior blisters, as you can see up here, but the blisters went away. You also see, when you look under the electron microscope, that you see no anchoring fibrils here, and you begin to see them here. So the proof of concept existed that not only did we cause survival in these animals, but we did so with replacing anchoring fibrils, at least in a rudimentary form, and we also saw the blisters decrease. Does it mean that they never could get blisters? No. If you actually then roughed up the animal in a sense, that yes, if they were traumatized at all, they could still get blisters that ordinarily wouldn't happen. But the blister formation was markedly decreased, and it took a lot for those blisters to form in contrast to the normal animal. So this now led, after about you know, three years of doing those, that, those experiments, that I should point out to you was funded only by one family, the Lau family because nobody else would believe that a group of leukemia doctors would ever be able to find a cure or something that might benefit a group of patients who had a severe skin disease. So I understand that that's, that's a very common thing to happen, not just unique to EB. So in any event, what we were able to do then is to say, okay, we have the proof of concept that this can work in the animal, but boy, how am I gonna figure out what the right dose of chemotherapy is? Remember that a kid with EB has a normal bone marrow function. It's not a child that I would typically take care of where they've had chemotherapy after chemotherapy after chemotherapy because of leukemia, where their bone marrow and immune system is already beaten down to an, a, a certain extent. But a patient with EB actually has a very hyperactive bone marrow. We, they're producing white cells a lot more than normal because of the fact that they have chronic infections in many cases. And also, when you look at the antibody production of kids with EB, which was previously not known because the dermatology field didn't look at the immune system the way we look at the immune system, well, we find lots of immune irregularities in children with EB. Some are very immune depressed, and others are very hyperactive in terms of their immune function. And we can discuss that a little bit later. But the point I want to make is, is that this is a marrow typically that's prepared to reject anything that comes in that's new. So it made me believe that I was gonna to have to give higher doses of chemotherapy than I typically would, and be more like a patient with refractory leukemia, where I had to give higher doses of chemotherapy than usual to kill off those residual leukemia cells. But in this case, it wasn't leukemia, it was a hyperactive marrow. So what I did is I came up with a regimen, uh, which I'll show you in a second, but a regimen that was gonna be very toxic, even to a non-EB kid. And yet, at the same time, I knew that that regimen was what I believe was gonna be necessary to get those new stem cells to work. But let me show you what happened. Well, first off, I should point out to you that because of the risk associated with this experiment, so to speak, what we had to do is we had to go back and actually say, how can we do this in the most um, uh, objective way? How can we do this so that we don't put people at risk at, you know, for something that they shouldn't go through? And so we had an expert team of people from around the world evaluate these children over the internet to be able to say, was this patient an appropriate candidate for this type of risky therapy 
or not. Obviously, you had to have very bad disease to go forward, but at the same time, you also had to have uh, patients who were, or parents who understood exactly what was being asked and what was also what the risks were. So at the end of the day, it depends upon the type of donor you have, what the risks vary depending upon the donor. The more mismatched the donor, the riskier the transplant. The older you are, the riskier the transplant. So there are a number of factors that you might not have known up front, but we know those from all other types of transplant before we even get into EB. So they screen the patients for us, and in addition, they also evaluate the responses of the patients that we take care of. So when we report to you what we believe the results are, it's not just our opinion. It's a group of others that look at the data to evaluate it in a more objective way than what we possibly can do ourselves. Because like you, we want this to work. At the same time, I don't want to mislead anybody but from my hopeful thoughts. At the same time, then I had to come up with this regimen, but one that was not going to be too toxic, I hoped, but one that was going to be sufficient to get the stem cells to work. And this is what the regimen was. You don't need to know the details of it, other than the fact that it was busulfan, fludarabine, and cyclophosphamide, drugs that we typically use in patients with undergoing leukemia, but this was a very high dose therapy. We also use unfiltered marrow because we do not want to take the risk that we might remove something inadvertently that was the stem cell responsible for the beneficial effect. So at the end of the day, this is how the patients were uh, treated in this first phase one study. You can see there was a total of seven patients enrolled in the study. Six actually underwent the transplant itself. So this is data that I'm sure many of you, if not all of you, have seen. This is the first patient. This is now Nate who was the first child to undergo this therapy. And I'm not sure if we're able to bring down the lights a little. Is that possible or is that impossible? May not be possible. OK. But maybe you can appreciate that you don't see any uh, collagen 7 here. The collagen 7 is shown here. Is, do, can you see this red line? And you don't see it before transplant. You don't even see it in the very early days after transplant. But the bottom line is, is that this child had very few side effects, if any, from my point of view. So, and had an HLA matched sibling donor. So the transplant was very, went very well, except that, boy, it took a long time for me to see any response. In fact, Teresa Lau kept saying to me, I think I see him looking better. In fact, he actually looks different, physically looks different than I've ever seen him. But I thought it's just another, you know, mother wishful thinking that this is actually getting better. But in fact, when we actually saw the response at day 200 and 360, we then began really believing that not only was his skin looking better, but he was now off all immune suppression, his activity level was getting better, and in fact, he did appear to be different than what he was prior to transplant. So in any event, although you can certainly argue that, you know, as, as all of you know, skin fluctuates. Sometimes the skin can look terrific in one spot and can look different another day or two later. But the bottom line is, is that well, we had several different tests that came back that suggested that perhaps this was going to be something that might benefit these children. I should point out to you is that Nate didn't always look this good. He does have fluctuations over time, and I can't explain why that's the case. But nonetheless, overall, at least the last time we had seen him a year ago, overall he had improved. But in fact, he turned out not to be the best improving improvement that we had seen. In fact, his was more modest than what we had seen in many of the other children. Why that's the case is also something else to be explored, and I'll explain more of that over time. The one thing we also want to do is to figure out how can we more objectively determine whether or not there's improvement in the skin other than just looking at it. And what we were doing pre at the, in the very beginning is that we were measuring how many dressings the parents used. So we would weigh your dressings each day, or whatever they were changed, to see whether or not you were using fewer dressings compared to the past. That was one strategy, certainly not as objective as we'd like. And then what we were able to do is to come up with a strategy of actually doing what we call the blister test. That is exposing to small patches of skin to negative pressure, sort of a suction machine, to see how long it would take for a blister to form. Give us an idea of how much Velcro was actually there at the skin epidermal dermal junction. And so what we could tell you is that in this particular patient, you could actually see that you see now the, the donor. The donor was not a carrier in this case. We can actually probably tell who is a carrier and who is not a carrier just by doing the blister test. And you can see that the mother and father are shown here where they have not quite a normal phenotype. So those of you in the, par the parents in the audience, 
you probably, if the blister tests were done on you, probably we could tell that you were indeed a carrier, which you have to be. And we might be able to tell even what, you know, one of the other children might be who don't have EB, whether or not they carry the disease. Of course, this is not a validated test, but certainly the data suggests that that might be doable. At the end of the day, what you can see here is this, this is where this patient number seven started off, and you see what happens over time. We see that there is now more objective proof that there's more resistance to blister formation. So that was encouraging as well. So remember that what we were doing is not only trying to figure out how much chemotherapy and immune suppression we had to give, we were trying to figure out how are we going to present this data to you and to the scientific community that would hopefully convince people that this is good or not good or somewhere in between. But I should point out to you also is that with this busulfan regimen, it was toxic, at least to a few patients, and one in particular. And you can see here, perhaps you can appreciate that the lights are bright, is that you can see where we started off in the beginning, and then by day 17, the skin was much, much worse. In fact, it was so bad that it was actually, I thought we could not continue with the use of busulfan any longer in these patients, because busulfan is known to be toxic to the skin and to the lining of the mucous membranes. But nonetheless, we were also getting fairly consistent engraftment. So I was afraid to decrease too much at that particular time point. Nonetheless, we knew that this was a problem and we needed to find alternative conditioning regimens in the not too distant future. But fortunately, in this particular instance, it was only another two weeks and the skin was actually so much improved, it was one of those times when you say, this is a miracle. We had gone from this to this, and in fact looking better than we had ever seen in a very long time. So what we also did was now with collaborators uh, in different parts of the country was to able to go back and, and figure out how much collagen was actually being deposited into that dermal epidermal junction. And we actually measured it and showed it in this more graphic way, not just one patient as you saw in that first figure where you saw the more increasing redness but looking at and see whether or not we could actually demonstrate this for more than one patient. And you can see predominantly using the antibody developed by uh, Dr. Chen and Dr. Woodley, we were able to show that in the, most of the patients we were able to show some improvement. But I wanted to show you some examples of where it was not so dramatic. Here we see very modest improvement, and here we see no improvement in patient number six. And in fact, as I'll show you in a slide or two later from now, is that patient six had no evidence of engraftment in the skin. So that may be a clue as to what the importance of that is cell and graft in the skin might be. So this is patient number six. Remember I showed you first study, patient number six. And you can see here that there is no collagen seven. You see no red mark here along that dermal epidermal junction. This is the outer layer of the skin. This is the deeper layers of the skin. When you looked at the skin overall and the clinical effect, you saw that there perhaps was some modest effect, but that might be more related, you know, at least at this time point, maybe to less activity level, I can't tell you. But the bottom line is, is that it appeared to be some improvement, but nothing very much um, that we could for sure say to you. But nonetheless, what we saw was no anchoring fibrils in the electron micrographs, and we saw no evidence of collagen seven, at least during that first time year time point. Now we also saw something else where we, with a patient number seven is that we saw there was fluctuations over time that went along with the clinical picture. You might be able to appreciate that there was some stippling of the collagen seven, showing some mutant collagen seven at the very early time point. Look how much thicker it is at day 30. Remember how much better this individual was on one of the sites where at day 17 looks so bad. This is the same patient. Then day 60 seemed to get worse again and clinically in terms of blistering, and then gets better again at day 100. So why we see in this particular patient coming and going, I can't explain to you, but that was also a new pattern that we had not previously observed. So in any event, again, what we're doing is that as we do this, we're learning as we do this. So the one thing that we also saw was in this first seven patients, even though some patients had marked clinical improvement, and some of you may have seen the blog from, by Krista Boyd. In fact, at that first seven patients, certainly uh, Carrick Boyd had the most dramatic improvement of all, um, was jumping on trampolines, was riding bikes, was back to a life that he had not previously seen, and yet he had no clear anchoring fibrils at that time point. So it made us wonder, is there something else that's improving upon uh, this uh, phenotype that we, we don't understand? It didn't necessarily require anchoring fibrils. 
I have some guesses that perhaps we can discuss later on, but nonetheless, it was going against with what we predicted, or at least our preconceived notions, that might be playing a role as to what the improvement was due to. So can we expect normal anchoring fibrils ever? I think the answer is yes. This is also Carrick. Um, and you can see here there is one normal anchoring fibril as shown here. Um, certainly over time we see I've seen more in him. So it took a long time. So the other thing that we also now know is that it may take years before we see anchoring fibrils. At least, at least in this one patient, it seems to be the case. He's the furthest out um, except for Nate um, and certainly has the first to have had normal anchoring fibrils. But just so you know, we might see a clinical improvement well before we see normal anchoring fibrils, something we didn't previously predict. So why would it might be so difficult? Um, and certainly, you know, this is far more complicated than perhaps you're interested in knowing. But what I could tell you is that, you know, when you replace the missing collagen 7, for example, it's actually a complex structure where several collagen 7s need to come together and form in the right way to get that normal anchoring fibril. Think of one normal anchoring fiber, I'm sorry, one normal collagen 7 and a sea of mutant collagen 7, which is the rest of the body. And so it may be difficult for that one to find two others that come together in the right time point to actually form that normal anchoring fibril. It just may take time for that to happen when there is so much mutant collagen 7 that surrounds it. So we're learning as we do it, but that's at least one explanation of why we see what we see. So the next thing is, is that um, what we wanted to do was to figure out whether or not we could do this with other types of um, kids with EB, not just collagen 7 deficient children with recessive dystrophic EB. And we looked at now a collagen, I should say we didn't, but others uh, in Japan had looked at a uh, collagen 17 murine model. And the bottom line is, is that rather than going through all the details of it, they found the same thing. But in particular, one other thing that was of interest was that when they co-infused mesenchymal stem cells, which is showing the, the point I want to make here, is that they had a better outcome than if they just gave bone marrow alone. It was based on this idea that we went ahead and actually changed our preparative therapy, our conditioning regimen, no longer just to give the busulfan, cytoxin, and fludarabine, and not just giving the bone marrow stem cells, but we would co-infuse now mesenchymal stem cells from another person someone that's not related to you, someone that's healthy. It was what we call third party, not HLA matched, and just give those additional mesenchymal stem cells to see whether or not we would get any improvement. This is what they look like. These are what the stem cells look like here. Um, we're able to then take those cells. We can take any one of you in this room, take a small bone marrow aspirate or take fat or to take whatever tissue we would like and can actually grow those cells out in very, very large numbers. It is known that these cells have different capacities and functions, not just to repair, perhaps, tissues, but also the capacity to suppress graft versus host disease. Remember that immune attack by the donor cells against the patient. So we thought, if nothing else, perhaps this would be a way of making transplants safer. So now, the same, everything is exactly the same, with the exception of, of the mesenchymal stem cells that were added. So what we want to do is we want to see whether or not it made it better. Um, would it make these kids uh, have a, a, a safer course? Would it reduce any risks of, of graft versus host disease? What should I point out to you? So if at that point in time, we had only had one case that was possibly had graft versus host disease. So it wasn't something that was a big problem, but hopefully if we could make transplants safer, that was a good thing. And the other question was, we knew that mesenchymal stem cells could secrete collagen 7. Would that make it better? So in any event, what we would do is then perform the same transplant, but only with the addition of mesenchymal stem cells. In addition, we were the first time ever try to do the same type of transplant with patients with a junctional form of epidermal lysis bullosa, and hopefully see if we can get these patients through the transplant itself, realizing that these patients are actually more fragile than the RDEB kids. Well, I'm going to give you a lots of different data points here, but the first point I want to point and make to you is that we were able to show that in one patient with junctional EB, and there were two on this particular trial, they were able to get through the trial, or get through the transplant therapy, um, and show that we not only had improved amounts of uh, laminin 332 that was previously missing, but the patient was able to get through it and has had a dramatic response after the transplant. 
But I should point out to you also that these kids are by far sicker than when they arrived to us. And in fact, both children with junctional form of EB, um, both of them had sepsis before they even came in. We've had a number of children die even while during the transport uh, process of trying to get to the University of Minnesota. So it's clearly a very, very difficult disease. And the patients only come as whatever condition they're in. And so whether or not this is going to be something that truly works for the majority of kids, I'm not sure. But the, the key is the sooner the better before they get too sick. And in fact, this particular patient, although did get through the transplant, had a very, very rocky course, but was able to get through it. And we were able to demonstrate marked clinical improvement. And you can see here that not only is there the replacement of the missing protein, but you can see the change in the blister test over time. You can also see um, that there's evidence of, uh, of the cells where are the, the protein where it's supposed to be. That's where the immunogold stain is. You can see here there's evidence that indeed it's in the right spot, and perhaps the lamina 332 is there as a sufficient amount to affect this clinical improvement that was previously thought perhaps not possible with transplant, but indeed appears to give us hope that we can treat this disease as well as JEB. I'm sorry, RDEB. So now this is now looking at number, uh, study number two. You can see patient with RDEB, you see the pattern of the blister response. Pretty much the same overall. Sometimes you see some fluctuation, can't tell you why. But remember that although we try to do the blister test in the same area, perhaps at different areas of your body, there might be differences in just how strong the skin is and resistant to blistering. But I should point out to you that some of you may know about this child. This is a child, this is Peyton. Um, this is a child that was in that, uh, that uh, Discovery Channel um, story. If you remember at the end of that, we, you all didn't know what actually happened to Peyton. Peyton, at the end of the day, got through the transplant very well and certainly had a very marked response. Um, you can see here, perhaps you can appreciate just what he looked like right before transplant. And you can see what he looks like after transplant. He still has this one residual bad area um, in that one spot. Um, and it remains chronically infected, which remains one of the, I think, barriers to success um, is the chronic infections that we have to figure out how to overcome. You can see here the results of his blister tests over time. And we just saw him a few weeks ago, um, and he is looking quite good. So we're still searching for improvements, and so one of the things that we wanted to do was to get rid of the busulfan once and for all and figure out whether or not we could just use immune suppression by itself. And boy, I was nervous about doing this, but actually as it would turn out, there was a child, um, actually not so much a child any longer, you may know the story of Kyle. Kyle was um, a 16-year-old when he wrote um, a email to me and said, can I get what that first kid got? And uh, after a while, after a number of emails go back and forth, I said, did your mother know you're emailing me? <laughs> Actually, she had no idea. And so when I called her, um, said, you know, your son's been emailing me, she, she had no idea what was going on. Um, at the end of the day, though, is that ultimately, because he was so severely affected and because he was older, remember, age is not on your side uh, when you're going through a bone marrow transplant and you're getting older when you're hit 20. Um, and so what I could tell you is that uh, I decided he was the best candidate for trying this much reduced dose therapy with immune suppression by itself, getting rid of busulfan. So the question was what happened would happen to him? Well, we gave everything exactly the same, except now we got rid of busulfan and we added a small fraction of irradiation, which we had previously used in hundreds of patients undergoing bone marrow transplant for leukemia. As you can see here, I've now given this therapy to more than 400 patients with leukemia, and it works very frequently. And the reason why I give it to patients with leukemia is I give it to older patients that are over the age of 70. And so 70-year-olds cannot take high-dose chemotherapy, and so it works well for them, so I thought I would try it for kids with EB. Well, to make a long story short, so far, so good. This is Kyle. Kyle is patient 3.1. So what you see here, the dramatic thing is, is that rather than having about uh, 20 days without white count, he has only a few days without a white count. In fact, it's only two time points here, 
between day 14 and day, uh, day 12 and day 14 did he actually have what we call neutropenia, that is a, white, a neutrophil count, a type of white cell that fights infection of lower than 500. For, for all intents and purposes, he was at no high risk for systemic infection, in contrast to all other kids that had undergone this therapy with busulfan, where their white count is markedly low, zero for weeks. So you can see here it rapidly comes back up. He never received a single platelet transfusion. I'm not sure if he received any red cell transfusions. Actually, no, I reminded myself, no transfusions, um, which is something that others before him could never have said. What we wanted to do is then see what kind of engraftment would we get. We knew from the leukemia patients that engraftment started off mostly patient and would over time revert to all donor. And what you can see here is that this gold here, that's the percent of donor. And in fact, I saw Kyle just last week and he was all donor. But look, it took him a long time to get to be completely donor, but nonetheless, he achieved it. Now, patient number two is a bit different. Patient number two, you see that there's some fluctuation, but it's hovering around 20% donor cells. And yet, her skin looks markedly better. So perhaps you don't have to have complete engraftment as we had had previously thought. Nonetheless, obviously time will tell as whether or not this remains stable or not, and whether or not the skin remains improved. But nonetheless, that's where we're at so far. Patient number three, reverted to complete donor. And I'm not sure if I gave you the others, but patient number four um, had no engraftment. So patient number four had rapid recovery, but the cells were never donor. So it doesn't always work, but I should point out to you, it doesn't always work with busulfan either. And I'm gonna summarize those who had graft failure previously. So whether or not it's different than the high dose therapy, so far I can't tell there is a difference, but nonetheless, it is a far safer therapy than what we've ever observed before. This is now patient number one. This is also just looking now at the electron microscopy. The bottom line is, is that you see now signs of at least uh, uh, some anchoring fibrils, but clinically, he is markedly improved. So this just summarizes the three trials. The differences, busulfan, cytoxin, and fludarabine, same with mesenchymal stem cells, mesenchymal stem cells with a new regimen, and that's where we are now. There are a couple of additional patients uh, that are on this. These are the numbers that I'm showing you here um, since this analysis was done. But I want to just summarize now the transplant results. Transplant results are that overall, you see, uh, overall we saw engraftment in 94%. That means this proportion of the patients did not have engraftment. Only one patient, as far as I can recall off the top of my head, had no signs of white cell recovery and required a second transplant, and that was Jake in the very beginning after an unrelated core blood transplant. Um, but the others had their own white cells come back over time. So you can see those results there. In terms of now looking at, is the risk any higher with cord blood as compared to bone marrow? And the answer is, I believe, the is yes. I would tell you that if I have a choice right now, bone marrow is my first choice, cord blood is my second choice if you cannot find a matched marrow donor. I think there's something different about bone marrow than cord blood, and in fact, I perform more cord blood transplants than anybody else in the entire world, more than 1,000 cord blood transplants in patients with a variety of cancers and non-cancers. And we can tell you that for non-cancers, cord blood is inferior to bone marrow. However, if you don't have a matched bone marrow, then core blood is what allows you to go to transplant because it can cross HLA barriers without an increased risk of graft versus host disease. Now, when I talk about you know, being better or worse, we're talking about it in terms of engraftment. Okay, so if I have my choice, what I would say to you is you can see the data here, the data is the data. So engraftment occurred are basically three patients had graft failure in the unrelated cord blood setting. Those patients with cord blood, we had several patients with cord blood that were sibling donors, but we mixed it with bone marrow because we had access to the same donor and we collected some bone marrow to go along with it. And so they're all here. So those with a sibling donor have good engraftment. 
And you can see here that the unrelated donors have good engrafment, and I say three out of four, but just only because one of them is just has neutrophil recovery, but we haven't tested yet. He's only 16 days out after transplant, although he has white cell recovery. I haven't done the test to prove that it's donor or not. But as you remember, you know, one of the things we found in the animal model was that there were cells in the skin. The cells in the skin, not just in the bone marrow that were all donor, but there were cells in the skin that were donor. And is it these cells that are secreting the collagen 7? It would suggest, because of where the location of that donor cell is, that perhaps it is where the collagen 7 is being secreted, and perhaps that's why we're seeing improvement in the skin. And in fact, when you put all patients together and look at the proportion of donor cells in the skin, there's fluctuation over time, but the bottom line is there's something around 15% overall as with the proportion of donor cells, and it remains fairly fixed. Although for a given patient, you can see fluctuations. And in fact, when I just saw um, Kyle last week, he has 40% of his skin is derived from the donor. So, and yet previously it was around 15%. So it does fluctuate. And that may be where we take the biopsies from. But the point is, is that when you don't have any engraftment in the skin, the results are not good, as you might expect. But I can't tell you if more is better, and in fact, it doesn't suggest so far that's the case. Having some is what you want. I don't know how to otherwise tell you if more is better or not. We would certainly need larger patients and numbers of patients to be able to tell you that. So now this is going back and looking at Kyle again, although unfortunately the lighting is not going to work out for you, but you can see um, re reappearance of uh, the collagen. You can see in patient number two, reappearance of the collagen. In patient number three, you can see reappearance of the collagen, or a patient with a JEB, reappearance of the collagen. Um, the, or, the, or I should say the laminin 332. Um, but nonetheless, um, what we also want to tell you is that patient number four who failed to engraft had no um, uh, evidence of uh, the, the missing collagen 7 for which the transplant was performed for. But on, the, but on the other hand, he does have some clinical improvement, but nonetheless that may be more due to inactivity than any real transplant benefit. So one thing that uh, Dr. Tolar was able to do was actually go back in one patient where there was a male donor into a female recipient. That is, is that it's a male donor goes into a female patient with um, RDEB, where we can actually track the cells and determine whether or not those cells, whether they were bone marrow cells, that is, were they white cells that would circulate through the skin, or whether there's non-white cells. And although you may not be able to appreciate it, these cells are costain blue for me measuring white cells. Um, and then, but if you look at these other areas, there's no costain in blue, which means that these cells are not hematopoietic. That means they're not bone marrow producing cells. What are they so far? Dr. Toller, tell me the answer. <laughs> He's working on it. In terms of graft versus host disease, interestingly, we've only seen it in several patients. So graft versus host disease seems to be less than I would have ever predicted based on what we know with leukemia patients. That's a good thing. Is there something different biologically about these kids and their skin, making them less likely to be targets for graft-versus-host disease? But nonetheless, it's been very low. In terms of uh, chronic graft-versus-host disease, it's also been very low. In terms of uh, early transplant-related mortality, that's death from the transplant itself, it's certainly not what we like it to be, which is zero. But certainly, is, is most of the patients have done OK uh, with the transplant itself. So in terms of the overall survival, this is obviously the, the take home message here, is even though the majority of patients that have been undergone transplant have shown improvement uh, to some extent and some very dramatic, it is a risky therapy. And the question that we have to ask ourselves every single time, and the reason why we have the panel of people reviewing these patients with us, is the patient of appropriate risk from the disease itself to warrant the risks of the therapy. When you specifically tease out those patients with RDEB, 13 of the 17 are alive. And those with JEB, we've been able to rescue one of the three. JEB, those kids are much sicker. And so certainly we're going to be very challenging in getting those kids to the transplant. But the sooner we get the patients, and the better shape they are, the better hopefully the outcome will be. Now this is putting all three studies together. So far, when you look at the most recent study, the toxicity rate has been far less. Patients have been discharged very early, relatively speaking. And the overall um, success, I think, probably will, uh, over time, be uh, proven to be better. 
There's been five patients, four of them were alive, the one that died had JEB. So this is what we went to do, is to change the quality of life of these kids. This is Derek jumping on the trampoline. Hopefully what we like to see is all the kids jumping on trampolines, riding bikes, um, doing what they did, uh, what they're, why they did this transplant to begin with. And as you know, when we were in Canada, we were actually uh, asking the patients why did they under went, undergo a transplant. And some of the most moving stories we could ever imagine that would bring tears to everyone's eyes about asking the child, why do you want to go through a transplant? And in fact, some of the stories are, I just want to wear you know, flip-flops, or I just want to be able to play hockey, or I just want to do some of the things that we take for granted that the rest of us do every single day. Not that you take it for granted, but the rest of us do. And so if we can do something to hopefully change the quality of their life, then it's worth pursuing. On the other hand, what we need to do is we need to make it better. It's not good enough. And so, in conclusion, the infusion of marrow stem cells is the only way right now that can provide systemic, that is the entire body, with protein replacement. And at least in some patients, it can have a very dramatic improvement in their overall lives. The clinical responses observed in patients with severe JEB and RDEB certainly have been observed, but the mechanism of that response is not quite clear. And certainly there are challenges in the care that persists. Now, what I want to do is really to kind of highlight a few points. When you're going through a transplant, you have to remember that you have a dermatology team and you have a transplant team, and the two teams don't know what the other one does. Dermatologists know not very much about transplant, and transplanters don't know that much about dermatology. And so trying to pull these teams together has certainly been a challenge, but it's happening. But it's not just those teams. It's also the anesthesiologists, the gastroenterologists, the nursing. Those EB centers that already exist certainly know that concept of how to bring the team together. And so it certainly has taken time for that to happen. But the next big problem is what happens when I send you back home? It puts you back into a place where it's very difficult because your dermatologist at home or your hematologist at home doesn't know what the other one does. The hematologist at home can certainly give you transfusions should you need them. Uh, certainly can you know, treat you for infection, but certainly has no idea what this skin disease is. So it's become much more of a challenge than I had thought. And many times patients will stay in town you know, for a longer period of time simply so we get over that early phase of the high risk period, which is really four to six months. Even something as mundane as putting in central lines has turned out to be a big issue. And in fact, what we've been doing is trying to figure out ways of making the lines even safer. For the first two patients, before even day zero happened, that is the day of transplant. Remember, in my life, day zero is the day of transplant. Everything else is relative to that. Um, and so what I can tell you is that developing new central lines has been a, 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 an important task of trying to figure ways of making sure it didn't fall out. For the first few patients, they fell out three or four times, and we hadn't even gotten to transplant day yet. So certainly that's been one issue. The anesthesia has been you know, an issue that was, turned out not to be a big problem because we had a team that was so interested in caring for the patients, they certainly exceeded all my expectations in the care and concern for these kids with EB. Masks turned out to be more of a hassle than we had liked. Um, you know, certainly we had hoped that we could actually have 3M that's only a few doors down from us to help develop new masks. But, you know, little faces are not a big market for, and so therefore um, we've had challenges where typically the families actually come up with a better strategy for the mask than we do. Actually, I actually can tell you the families take care of the patients predominantly um, more than we do. We're there, there to assist, um, but clearly this is not something people can pick up. And I very naively believed that one thing, one strategy fit all. But as you all know, you all do something different, and you will swear by it. <laughs> Wound care was a big issue, because you all know that many patients will come to us already heavily colonized with resistant pseudomonas and MRSA. It certainly does not make our job easier. It makes it more difficult. But at the end of the day, you know, for the most part, we're able to get through it. Um, so that's not been something that's prevented us from moving through, but certainly does make the transplant more risky. And certainly with this new conditioning regimen, I think it's going to be less risky over time. 
The one thing that we had to develop was the tubs. I don't know, for those of you with younger children, the tubs may not be so important, but for those with older children, the tubs in order to do the dressing changes and cleaning areas, certainly made it was a major ordeal. And so getting our hospitals to put tubs on a transplant floor where water is not our friend turned out to be a big ordeal. But nonetheless, that's been overcome as well. So certainly you have to have the right environment that's willing to work with the families, that's really worked with the community to make this happen. We've been investigating new beds, we've been investigating new ways of doing uh, new uh, uh, dressing changes, um, and certainly this is not something that bone marrow transplant centers typically have any expertise in whatsoever. So why are the results um, not great for all patients? Well, certainly the only thing I can tell you is that if you don't engraft, the results won't be good. Otherwise, we don't know what the answer is. The, there, is it possible that mutant collagen is interfering with the normal collagen that's being uh, made? Are there antibodies being formed against the collagen 7? Because remember, if your body has never seen collagen 7, at least normal collagen 7, seeing it for the first time might mount an immune response to it. But we've not been able to detect that so far, so that doesn't seem to be a problem, at least that we can tell. Is there subclinical graft versus host disease? That is something that we can't quite detect. Um, but the answer is, is that I'm not sure that that's true. We've only treated a few patients for graft versus host disease. I think the biggest barrier is these chronic infections. There's certain bad areas um, that seem to be chronically infected and getting that sterile has not been an easy task. So in terms of bone marrow versus core blood, I've already given you my biases, even though I'm the biggest proponent of core blood probably in the world. But in this particular case, I would say that core blood does not contain as many stem cells as does bone marrow, and therefore, bone marrow gives your best chance of engraftment, and for sure, without question, it has superior engraftment in every other disease, so why not be better in EB as well? It contains also a higher frequency of other cells that are called mesenchymal cells. Could that be playing a role? Perhaps. The other thing is, if you have bone marrow, then we have a bone marrow um, where we can actually then expand those mesenchymal stem cells for, so that in the future, it can give you more stem cells that are matched with the donor him or herself. And therefore, perhaps will give us a better response in the future with mesenchymal stem cells. But cord blood allows us to cross HLA barriers that otherwise we could not. Now, have any of you heard of the Savior Sibling? The Savior Sibling was something that um, I had developed back in 2000. It was the idea that perhaps you could have a child who, where there's a family with a genetic disease where you can actually ensure that you don't have another child with a genetic disease. But at the same time, I could also ensure that you have an HLA matched child for the child that might benefit from transplant. So this is a disease called Fanconi anemia, another disease, a genetic disease, for which both parents are carriers and they happen to have a child unbeknownst to them that would have this disease in the future. The only way to be cured of this disease is with bone marrow transplant. There is still nothing that will treat these patients other than bone marrow transplant. And in, back in the 1990s, if you had a sibling donor, your chance of being cured was about 85%. Alternatively, if you had an unrelated donor, your chance of being cured was about 20%. So you can imagine what many families would choose to go after, that is the HLA match donor. So the idea here is that what we would do is in vitro fertilization, we would then remove a single cell as I'll show you in a second, and in that single cell we'll test both for the disease and we'll test for HLA typing. I'm not going to go through IVF, but just suffice to say, then the mother goes through multiple injections of hormones to stimulate the number of eggs. For again, as you know, normally in a cycle you have one egg produced. This would produce on the order of about 10 to 20 eggs. Those 10 to 20 eggs will be then fertilized, as shown here. This is called ICSI procedure, where you take the father's sperm, you nick off the tail of the sperm, and you can see perhaps here it being injected is then the head of the sperm into the egg. So this procedure um, is done very frequently. We do nine uh, IVFs every day for this indication of pre-implantation genetic diagnosis for the Savior sibling. So what happens then shortly thereafter? This is now a prezygote. This is not an embryo. This is uh, either the mother or father's nucleus, mother or father's um, nucleus opposite. Eventually they will fuse, and at the moment of fusion, that then becomes an embryo. 
After about 24 hours, you'll see here that uh, that begins, actually the first division occurs by the end of 48 hours. Then there's another division, so that there's eight cells a day later. And it's at this stage that a single cell is removed and sent for typing as well as disease testing. What you do here, this is now the embryo biopsy. And so what you do is you actually, with a laser, that's a laser right there, this is actually putting a nick in the zona pellucida, the membrane around it. And then that nick is where you actually then put a, a test tube or a, a pipette and actually remove that single cell. And that's how the procedure is done. It technically is very complicated, but those laboratories that do this do this very frequently. And it's actually um, many, as I said, procedures done every single day. So this is the cell that will be removed. It does nothing to harm the embryo itself and allows you to determine which embryo has a disease and which embryo does not, which embryo is HLA matched and which embryos are mismatched. This is what it looks like afterwards. Each one of these is a stem cell that's capable of producing an entire organism. What you then do is you then do the genetic testing. In this particular case, it was looking at HLA typing first. And ET means suitable for embryo transfer based on this particular test. So embryos two and four were suitable for transfer. However, it was only embryo four that it was disease free. And therefore, it was embryo four that was implanted into Lisa Nash. The reason why we can talk about that is it was a very heavily publicized case. Uh, it was the Molly Nash case where um, she was the first recipient successfully of a transplant resulting from the savior sibling. So this is the hatching blastocyst. If you remember, there was a hole in that zona pellucida that you saw. This is what happens when you actually have create that hole, that the embryo then as it develops, it actually then pushes out of the zona pellucida, which is called a hatching blastocyst, which means is very likely to implant when put into the mother. This created lots of publicity, and perhaps some of you know why, um, but there was a pub that resulted in this book of you know, my sister's keeper, because they were concerned about the risks to the donor. Although this is all fiction, and this, none of this has ever occurred, certainly it is a potential risk that once you have the perfect donor, would you then be going back to the donor for other organs? And in this particular case, what we would do under the circumstance is that we might go back to the donor and ask for skin. Because remember, they're now perfectly matched with each other forever. But at the same time, so far I can tell you is only one patient so far um, that has done this procedure um, and done successfully and the transplant has been done. Um, and obviously um, that donor, that child, is loved as much as any other child, even though conceived to be the perfect donor for the child with ED. So this is a result after the, um, as a result, this is me back in 2000. This is Molly Nash. And of course, wouldn't you know that they would name their son Adam. So the headlines were the birth of Adam. That didn't help the cause at all. <laughs> so what are our future directions? Well, certainly many of you are gonna be hearing more about this over the next couple of days. There are certainly experts already in this audience and those yet to come that will be telling you about a variety of different approaches. I hope that it won't be in the not too distant future that we can either perfect bone marrow transplants so that we reduce the risk substantially. But nonetheless, if nothing else, hopefully you believe that we've set something in motion that might not have happened as quite as rapidly. By doing this first bone marrow transplant, I think that the idea of cell therapies being one day the way of treating your children will become a reality. We're certainly far from where we need to be, but certainly many people in this room are now working on new strategies of delivering cells, whether they be the patient's own cells that are genetically modified, or being some other form of cell population that might hopefully benefit these kids with this awful disease. But the one thing I tell the students is that you're gonna be prepared for attacks by your peers, and by the church, and by the politicians. And as I said here at the bottom, even though you learn to expect it, it still hurts. There's certainly a lot of people that would say that this is too risky a therapy for patients with EB, but I see it a bit differently. And for obviously, for those patients that have very severe disease, you do desperate things sometimes when you're under desperate circumstances. We've come a long way, and I think that we certainly can make this a safer therapy. And patients going to go going this therapy today 
will have benefited from all those things that we've learned from past patients. So in effect, we owe them a bit of a debt for having gone through the therapy first. But on the other hand, you know, I think that we can do things better and hopefully we'll make a change in the future. We've now done 20 patients. Um, there have been several patients done around other parts of the United States as well as in other parts of the world. Um, but nonetheless, I think that at least for our own selves, the one thing I'm gonna point out to you is that if every individual site does their own type of transplant, we won't learn very much. The only way we've been able to make changes so far is by taking observations that we've learned at the bedside and then going back to the laboratory to make it better. So just keep that in mind that not only is the therapy given perhaps a bit different, all with the best intentions of making it better, but we can't have transplant centers everywhere doing the same type of treatment because we'll never have enough to learn from patients. So in summary, bone marrow is my first choice, core blood only if you don't have the match donor. Only go to a center experienced in BMT and with a defined research plan. If nothing else, we need to learn from each transplant. And transplants should be limited to those with the severest disease where the risks of the disease itself warrant the risks of the transplant. Certainly I need to acknowledge many, many people, but certainly Jacob Tolar, who's in the audience, who is speaking tomorrow. And to our funding agents and Teresa Lau. So this is Kyle. Kyle turned 21. And as you might be able to make out, he was very proud to show me he was drinking beer. <laughs> I'm so happy he was able to make it to his 21st birthday, and he looked terrific. Thank you very much.